This incredible book of Isaiah is a book that tells us that Yahweh is the one who provides salvation, that he is in control of his people. We saw the connections back into Deuteronomy 32 and the foundation of Deuteronomy 32, which forms the basis and comes out throughout the book of Isaiah. And we saw that in Deuteronomy 32 was essentially a summary, God's prophecy of the uh, prophecies that he had made in Deuteronomy 28 through to, to Deuteronomy 31, where he said, when you come into the land, this is what's going to happen. And you're going to wax fat and you're going to kick against me on, and I'm going to bring judgment against you and you'll turn back and then, I'll, and then you'll turn away again and I'll bring more judgment against you and you'll turn back and then you'll turn away again. And eventually you're going to be taken into captivity. And he gives this incredible history of the entire nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 28 through to 31, including the bringing in of the Roman army against, against Israel and their dispersion throughout the world where their life would hang in doubt before them. But that God's message in Deuteronomy was, I will bring salvation and I will save you and I will turn you again. And Deuteronomy 32, exactly the same message. And when we come to Isaiah, we find that it is the message of Isaiah. It is Yahweh who brings salvation. That in spite of the tragedy of his people turning against him and ignoring him and doing their own thing, Yahweh would work with his people for thousands of years until eventually he would bring salvation. And that that salvation would be through Emmanuel, God with us, his son, who he would bring upon the earth, his suffering servant, so that his purpose with his people could be fulfilled. We saw that one of the keys to Isaiah is that little phrase at the beginning concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The vision of Isaiah, which he saw in the days of these kings, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So actually that tells us this whole book is a book which is about God's work with Judah, with his people, with his land, and with his city, Jerusalem, and their eventual restoration into the glory of all the earth. And we shall find... This, this evening together, brothers and sisters and young people, this incredible continuation of this story. We shall see, we shall start to pull together, God willing, the structure of this book. As, as I acknowledged in my first class that, that the book had broken me a little. I, I came to it with a certain arrogance that I'd be able to get my head around the book and, and was really struggling to do so. And that, that is still the case, but there's just little jigsaws starting to come in place now. And thank you to those who have spoken to me over those last, uh, that last fortnight as well. With little bits of gems that have helped to, to set that structure in place. And again, tonight, God willing, we'll place a jigsaw or two more on the structure of Isaiah and understand the context of, of this structure. And then we're going to hone in in Isaiah to the section on the king. And we shall find this incredible power of God's purpose through his king. Not the weakness of kings of Israel, or, or human kings, but his son, who would become the king, who would overthrow the Assyrian and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So by way of, of context, let's just go through uh, Isaiah's context that we discussed last time. So, uh, so, so, judgment, so here's the context of it. Isaiah's message is judgment is coming. It's inevitable. It cannot be stopped now. The people have turned away from God and God is saying judgment is coming. So his message is not to the entire nation to convert it and to stop judgment occurring, but to say judgment is coming and that a remnant would be the ones who would respond to, to Isaiah's message. That we saw that the strength of Israel, of the northern kingdom of Israel, was aligned to Syria, but that eventually Assyria came down to overthrow both Israel, the northern kingdom, and Syria, and to besiege, uh, besiege Judah, and that they would come right to the neck, that is right to the edge of, of overthrowing Jerusalem before they were um, overthrown. And that that was a weakening of the entire empire of the Assyrians achieved by God under Hezekiah. But that Babylon would replace Assyria as the scourge. That Yahweh's servants would appeal to the remnant and work with the remnant as Yahweh's salvation to them. And, and particularly the message of Isaiah, at the structure of, of Isaiah. And we did have a look at this uh, last time. So chapters 1 to 5 are a warning to the people. So remember we saw, saw the um, phrase at the start of the, of the book, give ear, O heavens, and hear, O earth. So the earth relates to the people and the heavens to the ruling uh, power of, of the nation. 
And so here in chapters 1 to 5, it's the message to the people. And then from chapter 7 through to chapter 12, it's the message to the king, and particularly King Ahaz, or to the heavens there. And we said, which we'll have a look at tonight, that chapter 6 is like a bit of a transition between those two. But I'm more and more convinced of that now, as we shall see towards the end of our talk together, God willing. But Isaiah 13 to 27 notes 10 burdens on the nations, and then the eventual conversion of those nations. That Isaiah 28 to 35 is the invasion of the Assyrian, and has elements of that in the past, that is in the time of Hezekiah, but also, as we'll see tonight, links into the future as well. That there's this historical section in the middle, uh, chapters 36 to 39, I've described there as the Hezekiah events with Assyria coming down, which is almost word for word the uh, same as that in Chronicles and shows the, the coming down of the Assyrians and the events which affected Hezekiah at that time. And then into chapter 40 through to 56, which is the servant prophecies, and that's both initially the servant being the national servant uh, of Israel, God's servant Israel, but then because they would not respond that God would work through his individual servant his son, to achieve what he needed in, for the salvation of his people. And there's this interesting connection to the ideas of Babylon, which we shall explore shortly there as well. And then at the very end, uh, Isaiah 57 to 66 is Jerusalem restored. It's the Zion of the future and these beautiful pictures of, Isaiah and, uh, of Zion in the future. Now I've noted here, and we will cover this in one of our uh, future sessions, this there's this incredible explosion of visions of the future throughout Isaiah. It's, for the first few chapters, it's almost every chapter, and, and then it just comes up time and time again. So there's a message being given, and then there's a picture of the future that's drawn, and then come back again. And, and we looked at the fact that, that, that it's like the book of Revelation. There's a message of what's going to happen to God's people and the difficulty and struggle God's people would have. And then there's a vision of the future to, to encourage them and to give them that vision of what would happen in the future. Now, how many books, uh, sorry, how many uh, chapters are there in Isaiah 66? Any of the kids? <laughs> okay, <laughs> one chapter. <laughs> okay, how many chapters in Isaiah? I've already given it, haven't I? 66 chapters in Isaiah. How many books are there in the Bible? 66 books in the Bible. And, and so there's this sort of interesting correlation that we tend to play with in our, in our mind. Does that mean there's a similarity between I, Isaiah as being a synopsis or a summary of, of the entire scriptures. And I've, I've played with that a lot in my mind and, and worked it through, but the conclusions I was coming to weren't, weren't helpful. They weren't powerful. They, they seemed to be forced. So, so you have a look at chapter 1, and, and it commences with, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Think, well, that's the start of, of Genesis 1. There's references to Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 1. You think, great, I'm onto something here. Chapter 2, you can probably fit elements of the temple into the uh, exodus with the, with the tabernacle chapter 3 you, you're starting to shoehorn a bit so so yes there are connections there but it, but it falls away and there's not this beautiful chapter 1 is this and by the time you get to chapter 66 it's, it's revelation so those chapters don't of themselves represent each book of the bible but the more you look at it the more, the more you realise that there is a very strong scriptural connection uh, between Isaiah and its structure and that of the Bible in totality. So, there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. The first section happens to be 39 chapters that deals, as I've said, with the heavens and the earth, with Sodom and Gomorrah, the fall of the people, the kings and their failure, the challenge of the enemies, God's work with and against the nations, and the enemy being Assyria that warlike, political, fierce enemy that was in play. And then in the second, which happens to be 27 chapters, we have God's suffering servant who would bring salvation. The national servant Israel cast off, the Gentiles called to the hope, the enemy being Babylon, the religious, philosophical assimilation of God's people but that ends in the salvation of God's people and the restoration of Jerusalem. So what are we looking at? Well, at a high level, in the first section, we're looking at the Old Testament. 39 books in the Old Testament as it happens. We're looking at the creation of the heavens and of the earth. We see the fall of God's people and the establishment of the kings and of the history then of the nation of Israel under the kingdom of the kings. 
and of their failure. And throughout the section of the kings and throughout the prophets, we find the challenge of the enemy of God's work with and against the nations with his own people. And you could say that the enemy was Assyria. Now, I'm, I have a particular reason for saying that. Who was Assyria? They were warlike. They were political. They were fierce. So what were the enemies who came against, against Israel? Yes, they were, they were idol worshippers. Yes, they had their own gods. But in essence, the enemy of Israel's time was an enemy of national fighting, of, of national control. Who was the most powerful enemy that could overthrow the other nations around was the question at stake. In other words, under the Old Testament context, the enemy was the most powerful fighter, the most powerful, most warlike people. And in essence, in those first 39 chapters, Assyria comes to represent the, the nations and the overthrow of one another, and particularly of God's people, that occurred throughout the Old Testament. When we come to the second section, we have God's suffering servant who would bring salvation. Well, of course, that's straight into the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's the work of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, if I, if I read to you from Isaiah 40, which is the first part of, of that section, here's the commencement of it. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's related in the New Testament to the work of John the Baptist. And so we, so we get introduced immediately in this section into the coming of God's Son and the work of John the Baptist. And as I say, that the national uh, servant Israel would be cast off. The Gentiles are called to the hope. Yes, the Gentiles are mentioned, as, as we read tonight in Isaiah 11, but 17 times in that final 27 chapters, the Gentiles are mentioned. The hope going to the Gentiles is in this section, which, as it were, summarises the work of the uh, New Testament. That the, that the enemy is Babylon. Because by this stage, Assyria has been overthrown. They've been weakened. They've been sent away with their tails between their legs because over 200,000 of them died uh, when the, when the uh, angel went forth under Hezekiah and they all woke up in the morning and they were dead bodies. So the Assyrians have been weakened, um, put to death as it were, and the Babylonians now are the ones who were, who were going to come in ascendancy. It was about the salvation of God's people and the restoration of Jerusalem. And so you get this beautiful uh, picture here of the Old Testament and the New Testament within these 66 chapters of, uh, of Isaiah here. As I say, the, the structure doesn't work in terms of the minute detail of it, but when you stand back and look at the overall structure of it, you can see the way God is working here. In addition to that, Actually, if we just uh, come and have a look at this. So many of you will know this. Uncle Roger, you probably know this one particularly well. Uh, from the School of the Prophets, thanks to Uncle Roger and, and Uncle Dave. This is the red line, blue line, which you've seen before. And, and um, for those of you who haven't seen it before, essentially what the saying is, from God's perspective with his people, he has his people natural Israel initially, through, particularly through the Old Testament. And that then into the New Testament, there is a transition phase where his focus becomes on the ecclesia, on spiritual Israel as natural Israel are cast off for a time, and then eventually are brought, regathered back in, and God is all in all. And that on the other side, you have this focus on, an, on the natural Babylon, as it, as it were, like the, the military power that is overthrowing or the, the enemy against natural Israel, and that that also transitions to the spiritual Babylon, which is the, the Catholic system, Christianity, that fights against God's, God's people, as shown in the book of Revelation. And there's this, this beautiful transition that occurs. I'm suggesting that within this uh, allegory, as it were, within Isaiah, you've got exactly the same picture. That You've got the, the Assyria-Babylonian, as it were, the, the military power of the enemy shown in the first 39 chap uh, chapters. And that that then transitions to the spiritual, to the Babylon picture in the last 27 chapters. And that uh, likewise the focus goes from natural Israel towards the spiritual Israel, the restoration of the remnant, the bringing in of the Gentiles and the restoration of, of Jerusalem. But of course, in a way, where all Israel, both natural and spiritual, are gathered together in its entirety uh, in the end.
So this is about the battle of God's people. In the first section, in the Old Testament, as it were, you've got this Assyrio, this, this military power. In the second, you have the, uh, the New Testament, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the spiritual battle that would occur between God's people. So then if we come back and have a look at, at, the, at the book and, and look at the key themes of the book, we find that there are two very strong elements to the themes. One is the visions of the future. And as I've said, we'll look at this in, in more detail and I'll have homework for you in a moment uh, towards a, a future class around this. But there's this incredible explosion of visions of the kingdom that just keep coming out and out and out throughout this book of Isaiah. And the new heavens and the new earth. Jerusalem is the global capital. The king on David's throne. The nations in submission. There's the seraphim in, in glory. There's just this explosion all over the book of visions of the future that, that keep taking us into the future. And secondly, there is Emmanuel, the work of God's servant, of God's suffering servant who would bring salvation out of the Isaiah, the, the Emmanuel prophecies from, from Isaiah 7, uh, and, and also the servant songs from Isaiah 40 that would, would bring out the work of God's suffering servant who would bring salvation and the call of the Gentiles to the hope. So what what does that combination suggest to you? I'll open that up as a question. Can you see what's happening here? What are the themes of Isaiah? Themes are about the vision of the future. What's that? Can we say it's the kingdom of God and the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ? So in Isaiah, perhaps more than any other book in the Old Testament, we have the gospel being, being portrayed to us. There is the kingdom of God these incredible visions that keep taking us into the future and telling us that that's our hope, that that is the hope we have. And there is the work of Emmanuel, the name of Jesus Christ, which we shall consider in a little more detail shortly also. It's the combination of those two things. You know what's interesting, though, is that when I talked about that structure which shows the Old Testament and the New Testament relation to it, you would perhaps expect to see this theme of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ more strongly portrayed in the New Testament section. And you know what happens? We don't. The message of the kingdom of God and the power of the vision of the future and the fundamental reliance we have on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's servant, as God with us, is consistent between Old Testament and New Testament. It's consistent between the different enemies. And what that's telling us is that while the people of God may face different enemies, different challenges, different circumstances we go through in life, and we know that today we have those ourselves, the answer from God is always the same. Learn to trust that this is his salvation that he will bring. It is Yahweh's salvation. He is in control. And that the answer to these challenges, no matter what generation we live in, is to have an incredibly powerful vision of the future, of the hope that's before us as the reality of what we aim for, and an understanding, a deep appreciation for our need and response to and the impact of the name of Jesus Christ, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in our salvation, in our redemption, and forgiveness of our sins, and the restoration to immortal life that it brings. It's the combination of those two that has always been the power of God's salvation that he provides to us. And the message continues to be the same for us. Yahweh is in control. Relentlessly, purposely, he is in control. And even when the enemies come down and they come against the, the nation of Israel, what we find is that God is in behind those enemies, that he's bringing them down, that he's allowing this to happen for a purpose because he's trying to work with his people to develop them, and then he will take the enemy away, but he will restore his people. And again, that's what we see in our life, isn't it? Yahweh allows things to happen in our life. He brings challenges upon us in our life. He brings enemies against us, or so, so many times it's our own struggles that he brings against us, and we can't understand why it's happening. But Yahweh is working with us to teach us that this is his salvation, 
and to trust in the wonder of what he has provided to us in our vision of the future and in the salvation we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then also within the structure, we have the, the challenge, as it were, of, of this Hezekiah section. And we won't go into that in detail tonight, but I just want to give you a couple of suggestions in terms of what this section does. Because you've got all these prophecies that come, including warnings of what would happen, events that would occur, and then visions of the, of the future to encourage the people. And then sandwiched in the middle, right at the end of that first section, you have the, the historical years, the Hezekiah years, the, the Assyria actually coming down years. And, and, it's, and as I said, it almost replicates what's already available to us in the rest of Scripture and Chronicles. Why, why would the Father see, see fit to place this particular section in the middle of this beautiful book? And I think it's for two reasons. Firstly is, it mirrors the transition that would occur from natural Israel to spiritual Israel. So if you think about the end of the Old Testament time, and then you had this, this period of time where, where there were just the events that would happen to the nation of Israel as it transitioned from the Assyrian, as it were, from the natural uh, Israel towards the spiritual. And so you've got this mirroring pattern that occurs. So that's one reason. But I think more particularly, if you think about it, it's consistent with God's message out of Deuteronomy and his messages if what the prophet has said comes to pass then you can trust in him you can rely on him and so here in Hezekiah he has these prophecies in the first section of, of the book that are prophecies of what would happen to the nation of Israel to the nation of Syria to the nation of Assyria, to the nations around, and to God's people in Judah themselves. And that prophecy is then picked up in the Hezekiah section and fulfilled perfectly, fulfilled beautifully in incredible detail. And so actually within the middle of the book is this little, is this little section that says, Hezekiah has prophesied this, and now it's come to pass, now believe that he's a prophet. And that what he said is going to come to pass. And listen to what's going to happen. Because these are the things that God will accomplish. This is Yahweh's salvation. And it's, it's just reinforcing our ability to rely on and to take comfort in, in Isaiah. And what, uh, and what he is prophesying for us. So let's pick up the story then in Isaiah uh, 50. Uh, so, sorry, Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5 is, this, is the song of, of the vineyard, and we're not going to go in detail into this particular song here tonight, unfortunately, but what I want to do is just pull a couple of key ideas or key points out of, out of this section. Isaiah 5 and verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honourable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Is this a prophecy? But he's saying, my people are gone into captivity. Verse 14, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. The mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Hell hath enlarged herself, is the story. See, we're being told that Israel at this, sorry, Judah at this particular stage are already in distress. They've already had captivity come upon them. They've already been challenged by other nations around. And that it's to such an extent that hell hath enlarged itself, the grave has opened itself up and swallowed God's people, as it were. Hell hath, hath opened her mouth without measure. And, and open, the, the hell, the, the grave, opens up and swallows an element of, of God's people in. It's a picture of a people already in distress. So what is that time period? Well, come across, hold your hand here and come across to, to 2 Chronicles 28. Because this is exactly it in 2 Chronicles 28. 2 Chronicles 28 is the time of, uh, of Ahaz, the reign of Ahaz, who we know reign, uh, reigned in the time that, that Isaiah prophesied. Isaiah 28. 
and let's read from, uh, well, let's just set the context of it here. So, so Ahaz has begun to reign in, in verse 1. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not that which was right in the sight of Yahweh like David his father. Walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, made molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the nations whom Yahweh had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places on the hills and under every green tree. So, so this is a king who was wicked to the extent that he followed, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Made molten images for Balaam and burnt his children in the fire. He was an abhorrent king before Yahweh. So verse 5, Wherefore Yahweh, his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great, great slaughter. So captives taken away by, by the king of Israel, and who smote him with a great slaughter. Verse 6, for Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. That's the great opening up, isn't it? <sighs> Unlimited, swallows up without measure, 120,000 gone, sucked into the grave in one day, which were valiant men, because they had forsaken Yahweh God of their fathers. And the king's son in verse 7, and the governor and the second in charge of the land are killed. Verse 8, the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons and daughters, and took away much spoil and brought the spoil to Jerusalem. But a prophet of Yahweh was there, Oded, and he intervened. We won't go through the detail of it, but he intervened. And he said to this northern ten tribes who were not um, believers in God at this stage to, to the rulers, he said don't take them back Yahweh's delivered them into your hand because of how they've forsaken him, release them take them, uh, release them back to their to their people and the soldiers obviously weren't happy with that but the, uh, the heads of the children verse 12 of Ephraim stood up against them that came from the war and said don't bring the captives in, we're not going to open the gates, we're not going to let you bring those captains, captives in here our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. And so they turned around, they let those 200,000 captives go. So this is the context then that we're talking of in the reign of Ahaz. 120,000 dead in the grave. 200,000 taken captive and delivered only at the last minute by a prophet of Yahweh to whom the nation of Israel responded. That is the context we have here in, in Isaiah. So come back then to Isaiah in chapter 7. Because Isaiah 7 picks up, I believe, at this precise point in the story. came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. He was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So, so Ahaz is in the situation where he's, he's, he's seeing what's happening. He, he's unable to fight against them, and, and they've been, uh, uh, so, uh, they've been uh, overthrown by, by the Syrians and by um, Pekah, the king, king of, of uh, Israel. In fact, what I didn't mention in Second Chronicles 28 is that once, once they had done their slaying, uh, Syria came in. Once they had done their slaying, the Philistines came in. Once they had finished, the Edomites came in. So it was just nation after nation. They'd lost a, a significant part of their army. And nation after nation came in to fight against them and to overthrow uh, Ahaz. And, and he was at, he's at his wit's end here. So, so what's he doing? Well, he's, he's up. At, out at the, uh, at the pool, the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. He's, he's looking at the resources of the city. He's looking at the water flow that went outside the city and that, that in a siege would be under significant uh, danger. And he's out there, and Yahweh says to Isaiah, you take, uh, go to meet him with you and Shea Jashub, thy son. Now, Shea Jashub, you'll see in the margin, means a, uh, a remnant, the remnant shall return. I've got a little two there in my margin next to Shea Jashub. The remnant shall return. So Isaiah walks out with, with his, uh, his son with a name that says, God's going to save a remnant. And he, and he comes to, to Ahaz and his message is, take heed. 
Be quiet. Don't fear. Don't be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and of the son of Remelah. Don't worry about these two. They're just smoking firebrands and they're in their final stages of flickering. Don't be worried about them because they're going to be taken away. They've taken evil accounts against you, saying, let's go to, to Judah and vex it. Let us make a breach therein and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. But yet, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, it shall not stand nor come to pass. And so the, the message from Isaiah to, to Ahaz is, don't worry. They've come to fight against you, but don't worry. They're not going to overthrow you because the head of, of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is risen within three score and five years, within 65 years. Ephraim, Israel, is going to be broken that it be not a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Don't worry, Ahaz. Trust in me. I have this under control. But come back to Second Chronicles 28. We'll see what Ahaz was doing instead. Second Chronicles 28. Was he going to rely on God? Was he going to trust in God and, and his message of salvation? Second Chronicles 28 and verse 16. At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. So he had gone through all of this turmoil because he would not trust in Yahweh. And Yahweh is giving him a message to say, trust in me. Don't worry. They won't be able to come and overthrow you anymore. And what did he do? Did he respond? No, his intention was to go up and to call down Assyria. If they're against me, I'll call the big boys in. They think they're tough. Wait until the Assyrians come down against them. That's the real big boys. Then they'll run away with their tails between their leg, as legs, as bullies tend to do. Or as Ahaz is thinking here. I'm going to bring the Assyrians in. But what's the outcome? Verse 19 of Second Chronicles 28. For Yahweh brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked. And transgress sore against Yahweh. And Tiglath Pil, uh, Pilnisa, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. So the kings of Assyria came down all right. They didn't come down to help Ahaz. They came down and distressed him and, and took away his wealth. And this is the message that Isaiah has here to Ahaz. Trust in Yahweh. Don't go up to the kings of Assyria. And in fact, he then invites Ahaz to ask for a sign, as, as Hezekiah did later. Ask for a sign that I'll give you, that you can trust in. Ask for a sign. But Ahaz said, well, I couldn't possibly ask for a sign. I'm, I'm not going to tempt Yahweh. He positions it in a very spiritual sort of way, doesn't I'm, I? I couldn't do that to Yahweh. Why? Because he had no intention of listening to the sign, did he, or of trusting in Yahweh. And Isaiah's response, Hear, O house of, of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? Will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, etc., etc. And the sign was to come for Ahaz that would be the birth of a child who would represent, uh, who would represent God's uh, work with his people. Uh, and verse 17, Yahweh shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. It shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall hiss for the fly that's in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and the holes of the rocks and upon all the thorns, upon all bushes. And then it goes through and shows what that people would do to the nation of Israel. And so there's this devastating moment here where Ahaz the king, the, the king of, uh, of Judah, has now welcomed Assyria down, invited Assyria down, and God says, don't do it. Rely on me, trust in me. But instead, Ahaz turns around and he invites Assyria down, and God says, they're going to come down. They're going to come down, and they're going to destroy this land. And that's what then happens in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in, uh, in chapter 10 is, uh, is this prophecy, this, this devastating prophecy of what the nation of Assyria would do to God's people. 
Just, just have a look in chapter 8 and verse, uh, verse 7. Therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He shall pass through Judah. He shall overthrow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. The stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Ahaz, Assyria is coming down. They're going to wipe through the whole land of Judah. They're going to stretch their wings across the land and they're going to overflow like a river that comes right to the neck of, of, uh, of Judah, up to Jerusalem itself, and would besiege Jerusalem itself. This is an incredible prophecy of, of the coming uh, uh, invasion of the Assyrian nation against Judah as a result of what Ahaz had done. And see, what we're finding here is this is, this is the challenge between Ahaz, between the wicked kings of Judah, between the human kings, and what God would accomplish through his king. What God was accomplishing upon the land. And its initial fulfilment is here in the, in the overthrow of the land under the, Assyrian, uh, under the Assyrian Empire. They wouldn't seek a sign. They wouldn't trust in God. They would turn against him. And God would bring down this, this uh, nation against them. Verse 22 of, of chapter 8. They shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. And so this whole section then is this, is this repetition of what would happen. From chapter 7 verse 1 through to chapter 9 verse 7 is, is this story of, of what would happen with the coming down of the Assyrian invasion. And then it repeats itself through from chapter 9 verse 8 right through to the uh, end of um, chapter 10 as well. It's, it's this repetition of ideas of, of, of the Assyrian coming down and this different elements and different pictures of the Assyrian coming down. Now we're not going to go into the second section on, on Assyria and exactly what would happen to them and to Hezekiah itself. But I just want you to, to get the sense that this prophecy is a prophecy that relates to the time of Isaiah. It relates to the time of Ahaz in particular and is about this wicked king who would not respond to God, who wouldn't respond to him, and therefore his people were going to be overthrown by this Assyrian, by this warlike nation who would come down and, and come even to the neck. And it's a prophecy of, of what did happen under Hezekiah's years. But see, even as we read it through, we find that there's just a little bit of disquiet in our mind, because on the one hand there's this picture in which it's very clearly a prophecy of what would happen in Isaiah's time and under, under Ahaz and through into Hezekiah's time. But at the same time we get little indications that there's much more to the story than meets the eye. We get little indications, little elements which pop out into the future or, or, or give us an indication that something else is happening here. And actually what it's telling us is there's actually a dual application of prophecy here. So let's start to dig into this in a bit more detail. Come back to Isaiah 6. Now as I say, Isaiah 6 is, is this transition phase where it's talking about the, the judgment that would happen upon the people through to chapter 5. But in chapter 6 we're introduced to the concept of the king that would then go through to the end of chapter 12. So here it is introduced. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. What was Uzziah's problem? Why did he die? He had leprosy. Why? Because he'd gone into the temple of Yahweh. He had tried to be a king priest. Just remember that. Uzziah had tried to be a king priest. Do you know what Ahaz did? When he went up to Samaria, he saw an altar that he liked up in Samaria. He took the drawings of it. He took the details of it. And he brought it back and he said to one of, one of the faithful people in the land, go and build me that, that altar. And he did. And they put that altar in the midst of the temple of, of God. What's Ahaz trying to do? He's trying to play that role of the king priest as well. See, the challenge of these kings, of Uzziah and of Ahaz, was that they wanted to be the king priests, but they were trying to do it on their own basis. They were trying to do it in a way that they wanted to do. And what's the vision that we see here in Isaiah 6 in contrast? I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. What's he doing? He's sitting on a throne, so he's a king. Where's his train? It's in the temple. 
who's the king, and the priest together. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. Twain he did fly. And one cried, holy, holy, holy. And the, the post of the door moved. And we go through the story of this, of this picture of the seraphim, which is a, a picture of, of, of God manifestation, of the, of the vehicles of, of, of uh, people representing God. And then we know the story well, that, that verse 5 Isaiah sees that and he responds with, woe is me, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I acknowledge, I understand my uncleanness. I, I can't respond to this. I can't come before me. My eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of armies. And one of the seraphim detaches and comes and flies unto him with a live coal from the, uh, with tongs off the altar, puts it upon his mouth and says, I've touched thy lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. He's, he's been cleansed by the coal off the altar and then there's a voice that says, Who's, who am I going to send? And, and Isaiah responds immediately, I've been cleansed. I've undergone the salvation available to me from the coals off the altar. Here am I, send me. This transformation as he understands the power of, of forgiveness that he's received. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their eyes heavy and, their, and shut their ears lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And Isaiah is listening to that saying, what? That's my mission? Isaiah's mission, he's been told, is to go out and talk to the people in such a way that they would close their ears. They wouldn't listen to him. They would, they would see what was happening with their eyes, but they would not respond to it. They wouldn't open up their hearts and be converted and healed. And I said, how long is this going to be? Until the cities are wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man. So this is a prophecy of what Isaiah's prophecies would accomplish. That generally it would close up the hearts of his people and they wouldn't listen to it. And it would just be that remnant under Sheer Jashub who would return. But actually we find that this is a prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll know it well. Come across to, to Matthew 13. Matthew 13 and, and verse 14 to 15. Well, he says in verse 13 that the disciples were saying, how, how come you're talking to them in parables? And he said, verse 13, I speak to them in parables because they see, seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceived. perceive. So Matthew tells us that Isaiah 6 was actually a prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it related to, to Isaiah's work, but more particularly, it's a prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would come to his people, he would teach them in parables, he would teach them in ways that they couldn't understand. The veil was still upon their hearts, as it were, and they couldn't see the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore they wouldn't respond. So Matthew tells us that there would be a mission to an unresponsive people. We'll come across to Isaiah 7, and in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, there are different representations of, of how that's fulfilled in the time of Isaiah in, in his own children. There's elements of it being fulfilled in Hezekiah, but none of them in perfection, because it wasn't the virgin birth from Mary, and his name was not Emmanuel. But come across, in fact, I'll just read to you, given the time, from Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1 and verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, Mary will bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which is being interpreted, God with us. So we're told that the naming of the Lord Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of this prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 7. See it doesn't just relate to Isaiah's time. There's prophecies, two prophecies already here, which tell us that this relates to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how is it? Well, in Isaiah 7 it says his name is Emmanuel. 
But in Matthew 1, it says that his naming Jesus was a fulfillment of that. So in what way is the name Emmanuel the fulfillment, or the name Jesus, the fulfillment of the name Emmanuel? Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? We know Jesus is Yahoshua, Joshua, Yahoshua. It actually means the same as Isaiah. Yah shall save. So we're being told in, in the Lord Jesus Christ that God was there in his son and he would save through his son, through that boy that was there. Yah shall save, which picks up the idea of Emmanuel and the idea of Isaiah to say Yahweh is saving through his son. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told Yahweh is there with us. God is with us, revealed to us in his son. Or Isaiah chapter 8 and, and verse um, 7. We've already read this. The Lord bringeth upon thee the, the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overthrow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. 7 to, to 8. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. So it's not just the king of Assyria, it's the king of Assyria and all his glory. And as we read, he would pass through the land and overthrow and come over. Verse 9, associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Give ear, all ye, now listen to this phrase, of far countries. Gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. So this Assyrian army that was coming down was not just the Assyrians coming, but was to include all of the far countries of the earth. What's that a description of? Well, this Assyrian invasion under Hezekiah's time was to be a picture of the future invasion by Gog. Zechariah 14 verse 1. We know the words of that particularly well. Zechariah 14 and, and verse 1. I'll just read that to you. Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, and the, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the woman ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. See, it's, it's the same picture, isn't it? The Assyrian had come down and overwhelmed the land of Judah and had come even to the neck, up to the neck of, of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was besieged. And Zechariah says, all nations will come down, like Isaiah 8 had predicted. And right up to the neck, and at that time, Yahweh would intervene on behalf of his people. Associate yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces, because God would intervene on behalf of his people. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 to 7. The government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with just judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of armies will perform this. That's not fulfilled in Hezekiah's time. There is only one child who could come, only one son who was given, who would be able to bring in this everlasting peace, which would have no end on the throne of David. We'll have a look at this one in, in Isaiah 10 and verse 27, a beautiful little phrase. Isaiah 10 and verse 27. So Isaiah 10, we haven't had time to go through, but it's this incredible picture of God saying, Assyria, you're the rod in my hand. I'm bringing you down, verse 5. But verse 7, he doesn't mean so. He's out there saying, He saith, are not my princes kings? As my hand hath found them, verse 10, uh, so I'm going to do to, to Jerusalem. I can come out, verse 13, by the strength of my hand I've done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. God's saying, I'm using you as my tool to come down and to judge my people. The king of Assyria says, I'm here in my own strength to do this myself. And so he goes out and, and you know, God says, verse 15, will the axe boast against him that, that heweth there with? God says, you're just like an axe in my hand, king of Assyria. 
I'm the one who's welding you. I'm the one who's using you. And therefore, God is going to light up the, the nation of Israel as a flame and he's going to devour you, Assyria, and all the trees of the forest. And this incredibly beautiful language of the remnant being saved and the remnant returning. But verse 27, In that day it shall come to pass that his burden, the burden of the Assyrian, shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke, that is the yoke of the Assyrian, would be destroyed because of the anointing. The word is actually the anointed one. So why is the Assyrian going to be destroyed? Because of God's work with his son, with his appointed king. The latter-day Assyrian, the Gogen confederacy, that warlike nation who would come down against the nations of Israel and overwhelm it right up to the neck of Jerusalem will be destroyed by Christ and the saints, the anointed one. And that destruction will be because of the work that God has accomplished in his son. See, there's this beautiful underlying picture here, isn't there? Yes, fulfilled in Hezekiah's time, but in such a more powerful, more beautiful way in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and himself, uh, and the saints, that together they could overthrow the nations of the earth in the battle of Armageddon. In Isaiah 11, in Isaiah 12, take us in a beautiful vision in the future into the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth after the latter-day Assyrian is overthrown. There shall come, verse 1, a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. It's, it's a rod, it's a little twig that comes out of the stump of Jesse that's been cut down. The Assyrians were cut down, Israel had been cut down, Judah had been cut down and in captivity. And then all of a sudden this little, this little twig would come out of that stump. But the branch would grow out of his roots. We haven't got time now to have a look at the, at the concepts of the branch, but it's a beautiful picture of the king priest. Behold the branch, we're told in Zechariah. Behold the branch, and that he would be a priest upon his throne. It's the king priest. The branch would be the king priest who would rule out of Zion. It's a beautiful picture of the work of the Son of Man as, the, as that little stick, that little twig coming out of the stump of Jesse. And a branch, the Son of God, that would grow up out of, of the roots, out of the stock of the root of David. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahweh. How many spirits are there there? Seven spirits. The spirit of Yahweh that was to rest upon this man who was king in Jerusalem now. No more Ahaz, no more Uzziah who would set themselves up as defiant king priests. This was Yahweh's anointed one, established put in place deliberately by Yahweh, who was accomplishing his purpose and his salvation through his son. With righteousness, verse 4, he shall judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. There's this beautiful picture of the work of this king. The Gentiles are brought into it. Verse 10, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign, like a, like a banner that's been put up to call the Gentiles to it. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And he'll set his hand, verse 11, to recover the second time the remnant of his people in another bringing out of, of, the, uh, of his people, as it were, out of Egypt. Another exodus as he brought his people back. Verse 15, Yahweh shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. With his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it on the seven strings and men shall go over dry shod. There shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Israel. Yahweh is going to redeem his people once more in that second exodus and bring them out and restore the natural Israel back into his land with the Gentiles as part of that hope. 
in that day thou shalt say, O Yahweh, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Who's that? This is, this is the redeemed nation of Israel responding back to, to Yahweh. And because God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid, for Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And in a beautiful picture which mirrors the song of Moses, the, uh, the glorified nation of Israel are now redeemed are coming to understand and trust in the salvation that has been provided by Yahweh himself. Verse 6, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One in the midst of thee. This beautiful picture which starts to show us that underlying all of this story is the ultimate redemption of Yahweh's people the overthrow of the Assyrian, of the Gogian Confederacy, when the armies of the earth would be brought to north, to naught, and when God would redeem his people and restore them once more. But just come across to Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 in conclusion. Because Revelation 4 and 5 is this incredible picture of the glorified saints with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Father himself in glory in the future. And we, pick it, we pick up the story in, in Revelation uh, 4 and verse, uh, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. He was like a jasper, a sardine stone. There's this incredible picture about the... Uh, and there was a rainbow about the throne in, in sight like into an emerald. There were about the throne four and twenty seats with the elders. Out of the throne, verse 5, proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne was a sea of glass like, like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes. But before and behind this we haven't got time obviously to go through it but this is a beautiful picture of the glorified saints in immortality with the lord jesus christ and with the father with the with the sea like glass before them that's the nations of the earth subdued before them in uh, in uh, victory upon the earth and verse seven there's the uh, the cherubim the faces of the cherubim shown to us but look at this in verse eight the four beasts had each of them six wings about and they were full of eyes where's the six wings coming from in relation to the cherubim well it comes up as as uh, you may be surprised in Isaiah 6 above it stood the seraphim each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he did fly and with twain uh, he covered his feet so here is the seraphim, the same picture with the six wings being represented. And what is it that they cry? They were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. What's Isaiah 6 say? And one cried unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, that whole earth being full of his glory is, is picked up for us in Revelation chapter 5. In verse 13, every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. See, so the Revelation and 4 and 5 being, being one continuous vision is picking up elements out of, out of Isaiah chapter 6. It's this, it's this beautiful repetition of some of the key themes out of Isaiah chapter 6. But if you come across, and there's actually a whole lot more, which, uh, which I'm happy to take you through um, afterwards as well. There's this incredible number of connections from Isaiah 6 through to Revelation 4 and 5. But let me just read to you from Isaiah 11. And keep your eyes peeled in Revelation 5. You shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, of course, that's Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. Weep not. Behold, 
The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And in the midst of the throne, verse 6, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all of the earth. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because there happen to be seven spirits in Isaiah 11 and, and verse 2. The book is sealed in Isaiah 29, Revelation 5. The Lamb has the power to unseal the book. In Isaiah 11, the truth is sent forth to the Gentiles. In Revelation 5 and verse 9, Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. In Revelation 5 and verse 8, they having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of the saints. Isaiah 6 and verse 6, and the mirroring of the altar of incense. The coal is taken off the altar and used to cleanse the lips of Isaiah. But what was it that Uzziah and that Ahaz desired to be? They desired to be king priests in their own right. To do it under their own strength. And Yahweh said, that is never something you can do. That is my privilege. My privilege alone. Isaiah 6, the seraphim sitting upon the throne whose train filled the temple. Isaiah 11 is the king. The king with the spirit of understanding upon him and with the two girdles of the priests in Isaiah 11 and verse 5. And what's the picture that's given to us in Revelation 5? Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. See, brothers and sisters and young people, hidden here within Isaiah is in this little section here from chapter 6 to chapter 11, is this beautiful prophecy that Yahweh would fulfill his purpose upon the earth, that he would achieve salvation, that he would bring his son, that little boy, born forth from a virgin who would become Emmanuel, God with us, and achieve salvation. And that that son he would take and he would raise him up to be the root and the offspring of David, who would be the line of the tribe of Judah, and who would be a far greater king than any of the previous kings of Judah or of Israel could ever be, who would accomplish his purpose and save his people, Jew and Gentile together, and bring them in glorious immortality from all kindreds of the earth to be the immortal kings and priests of the Melchizedek in order in the future. Book ended. Book ending this section on the king. The king of Judah who could not respond to Yahweh is a beautiful vision of Yahweh's intention in Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 11 to bring in his own king priest who would bring his glory upon the earth. And that and so many other places beside, Yahweh convinces us, declares to us of the perfection of his salvation, of the glory of his kingdom, and of the work of his Son, by whom together we can, we can achieve salvation. Mm -hmm.